Hello, welcome to Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Elon Eleven. This is a comics podcast, and this is the show for people who are fighting to make sure that social media algorithms don't become the real anti-life equation, because we don't have Mr. Miracle in real life. Joining me today is someone who is writing about our favorite folks from the Jack Kirby's Fourth World in comics right now as we speak. It's Cecil Castellucci. Cecil is the award-winning New York Times bestselling author of books and graphic novels for young adults, including Shade the Changing Girl, Boy Proof, The, Pain J- the Plain Janes, Soupy Loves Home, the, Sta- the Year of the Beasts, Tin Star, and Odd Duck. In 2015, she co-authored Star Wars Moving Target, a Princess Leia anthology. She is currently writing The Female Furies for DC Comics. Her short stories and short comics have appeared in Strange Horizons, Tor.com, Womanthology, Star Trek Waypoint, Vertigo, SFX, Slam, and many other anthologies. In a former life, she was known as Cecil Seaskull in the 1990s indie band Nerdy Girl. She has written two opera librettos, Les, Les Aventures du Madame Merville, wow, I hope I got that, <laughs> world premiere in 2010, and Hockey Noir, the opera, world premiere 2018. Holy cow. She's the former children's correspondent coordinator for The Rumpus, two-time McDowell Fellow, and the founding editor, uh, YA editor at the LA Review of Books. She lives in Los Angeles. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much. <laughs> Did I pronounce your name properly? Yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, thank goodness. I just couldn't remember if I'd even checked. I don't <laughs> like being that person. That is an amazing resume. I mean, to writing opera librettos is a whole world of its own special is speciality and then writing comic scripts is of its own other one um i actually I mean, it, th- found yeah. it was kind of similar because you're collaborating with a composer the way that you collaborate with an artist um mm-hmm. and actually the two operas that i did were comic book operas so i call them op- graphic operas rather than a graphic novel um, where the we had projected images and captions and um, balloons uh, that sort of mimicked, um, uh, you know, uh, captions and balloon, word balloons in um, comics. So it was really sort of the intention was to make it sort of meld opera with comic books. <laughs> wow, that sounds amazing. How, how did you get started doing that sort of work? Um, well, this company in uh, Montreal called ECM Plus, uh, they commission contemporary, um, you know, uh, contemporary classical music pieces. And um, but what they do is they often put together uh, composers and choreographers or painters or playwrights and they commission sort of short new pieces by them. And um, they, you know, I was on their radar and they asked me if I wanted to do something. And I said I wanted to do a live comic book opera. Um, and so the first one, Les Aventures de Madame Merveille, they were in French, uh, actually had art by Cameron Stewart, Michael Cho, Scott Hepburn, and Pascal Girard. So it was really mm. like a comic book opera. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad that kind of work exists. If I wanted to watch it, is there anywhere I could? Yeah, I'll send you a link. And there's a there if you Google them, um, there's a, there's trailers on the YouTube's. That's so freaking cool. Well, how did you get started making comics? I started making comics. Uh, well, I'd always wanted to make comics. I always wa- I always thought that writing comics was something that. I would really enjoy and that I would really take to. And it wasn't until I'd read um, uh, this book by Ed Brubaker called The Dead Enders um, that it really, I saw that there was a a spot for sort of young adult um, stories, which is what I was really interested in because I I wanted to be a young adult novelist. but then, like, I, you know, would Google or Alta Vista at the time, uh, you know, how to submit to Vertigo Comics, because that sort of felt like where my natural home would be. And um, I couldn't figure it out. And there, I just thought, oh, OK, well, I guess I'll never write comics. And um, then Shelley Bond, uh, you know, who was um, at Vertigo um, back, you know, uh, in the day, uh, she was starting a uh, graphic novel line for girls called the Minx Line. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so she had read my first YA novel, which was called Boy Proof, which is about a girl who's obsessed with post-apocalyptic science fiction films and comic books. And most of the comic books that I name check in the novel are Vertigo comics. Um, she read that book and she thought, oh, well maybe. 
maybe this lady wants to write a comic book. And so she reached out to me after reading that. And my prose is very, I'm not really interested in a lot of description. That's sort of my, my weakness in, in writing prose. It's all, I'm always like, ah, who cares what they look like? I'm just, I really like a lean manuscript and I like action and dialogue. So I think she thought, that I would be that I would take well to writing comics as well and it was sort of a perfect synchronicity because I'd been like I've been trying to figure out how to how to get here you know so Mm. um so yeah so that Plain Janes was the lead title on the Minx line and um that was with um Jim Rugg and that was my first comic book awesome yeah that line is like really beloved and i know it actually did get a lot of new folks into reading comics yeah and and it's sort of um you know i think uh really you know now we we're sort of in this golden age of um young adult comics um and middle grade comics and uh you know the minx line kind of pre predated that like it came out before smile um you know reina talmiger's um smile and stuff like that Mm -hmm. that really sort of pushed everything you know to this golden age that we're in so i I like to uh, me uh, me and jim i always say well you know we put on our bonnets and we got in our wagon and we tried to settle the comic book west and we died on the road (laughs) but the comics middle grade and young adult comics are now here so it's all good (laughs) Wow. Yeah, it really is. Like it's been a, it's like the hot thing. And I I think it's really cool how you've in, in DC and in comics have really been able to shift to doing things that are not just YA focused, but are really definitely for an adult audience. Um, I think that the two sort of parts of the industry, like can each really learn from each other in meaningful ways? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think also it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think Shade the Changing Girl was a really nice way for me to sort of um, segue into more adult um, stories. Uh, because I mean, just because I write a lot of young adult stuff or children's stuff, kid lit doesn't mean that, that those are the only stories that I have. But with Shade, um, it being a sort of, um, you know, 20 something alien who possesses the body of a 16 year old girl it just married two of the things that i love most which is science fiction and young adult fiction um but also got to you know because i didn't have that um young adult moniker on it i could sort of push the story ideas without having to worry about you know um what marketing um you know like if it was going to fit in a young adult section or something yeah yeah it's um you know, and I also think about how when I was a young person, like I, I didn't really read anything that was marketed for young people. Like there, it was a couple of exceptions, but um, I think that, and then and as I got older, I, I came to appreciate it more. You know, I think people will find those different age brackets relevant in their reading and lives in different ways. That well, isn't always what the narrative says. And young adult didn't really, you know, start being a category until the sort of early nineties, you know, like mid nineties. So, yeah. you know, before then what happened is people would go from juvenile fiction, um, you know, to adult fiction or what I think people would go to is like juvenile fiction, uh, which is w- what we call middle grade now. And then they would go to genre. So you got your Westerns, mm-hmm. your sci-fi, your fantasy, you know, um, your romance, all of those mysteries. And then after that, they would go to Kafka or like, you know, serious, serious literature <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And then in the 90s, you know, you sort of start having this sort of young adult, like very specific young adult thing. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I I, um, we, I connected with you initially because uh, I heard that there was going to be a Female Furies comic series. Um I am a huge fan of Jack Kirby's work. I actually have a Jack Kirby, Mike Royer, Barda, like tattooed on my arm. So I immediately (laughs) threw out my cred on Twitter. Uh, I was like, hi, you don't know me, but you need to come (laughs) on my podcast because look, I have this tattoo. So clearly I am the person most invested in talking about this character, these characters with you. Um, And it's interesting because I, I really, I don't, think or talk about myself as being someone who's particularly a fan of particular characters I generally identify more in terms of like here's the creators whose work I care about most because you know I can spend years without bothering to pick up a comic that has one of my favorite characters in it if I just don't care for the creative team and if there's the right creative team I'll pick up like anything that they do even if it's not my usual cup of tea right Mm -hmm. um so with this i was just jumping into a blind basically um i actually realized later that i had read some of your one shot uh 
parts in um, Shade the Changing Woman, and it was freaking awesome. But I, I hadn't quite matched the name to you being assigned to the project when I when I straight up pitched, and um, and the comics weren't out yet. So I'm very relieved and pleased to say that they're excellent. Thank and, you. <laughs> um, and so thank you for joining me to talk about them. It's it's interesting. I. Mm, I, you're, you're coming into this series with it launching right after the end of um, the Gerards and King uh, Mr. Miracle limited series, which was this huge, big critical success. We've actually had a roundtable talking about the first uh, first half of it on my podcast a while back. Um, huge critical success. Uh, lots to be said about it. Um, and... I still predominantly was thinking about you taking on this title in light of the history that of Jack, Jack Kirby's work of it, rather than looking at it as a continuation of um, the uh, the recent series. But I, I do really think it's both, right? Well, I mean, I I sort of feel like you know Tom King and I, you know, occupy different spaces in um you know what the what the um the fourth world sort of legacy mr miracle big barda you know sort of is um i mean we're not connected at all um and i think that what i find really interesting is that both of our approaches he's he i look at his his fantastic series as a kind of domestic drama you know it's um Mm -hmm. you know it's it concerns it's very soft in a way you know even though it's hard um Mm -hmm. it's very soft you know it's very emotional um in a tent it has a tenderness to it um you know uh, questions obviously about fatherhood and you know and uh, you know what it means to be a man and all of those kinds of things and um that's one space that i think jack kirby really opens up in um in his fourth world i mean if you go back to the you know the original texts you know Mm -hmm. and um and and then i'm occupying a completely different space (laughs) you know which is um you know, uh, you know, what, it, what is it like to be a woman in a world? What is it like to be, you know, to be a, a woman who is very powerful in a world that is hell? Uh, and, uh, you know, how, how does that relate to, um, our situation as women here on this planet, um, yep. and stuff like that. And so they're, they're, I think that they're, they're all, they're the DNA in all of them obviously are, are, are very kindred and very interwoven, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I think that they all, like me, Tom, and Kirby, we all have our, um, you know, we all occupy our own space uh, by sort of putting a different lens on the same world. And you're also starting the story at at an earlier point, really, than what we see in, well, obviously much earlier than what they're handling in, in Mr. Miracle, but also at an earlier point. In, then in uh, the fourth world itself, we, yeah. you know, in issue three, which is when is issue three going to be out? Um, I'm going to say April 6th ish. And indeed, it is out now. <laughs> it are, you know, it, 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 April 3rd issue is one that takes place during Mr. Miracle. But but till that point, you've been telling a story that takes place early in the saga of the female furies, uh, all female warrior team of apocalypse and, um, sort of showing, uh, how the characters came into their roles and developed as individuals. And, um, and what I, what I really love is that, you know, like Kirby went and he created these characters that were these unique, individual, memorable females who were female characters who were not supposed to be like, super likable and cuddly they were all very hard-edged um and he set them out into the world uh but this you know but mr miracle and the fourth world got canceled ultimately before Mm -hmm. he wanted it to be completed and so we never got to see we never got to spend as much time with all of them as i would have wanted to certainly and while um you know big bardo went on to have a very fully realized you know life through a number of different writers um, you know, most of the other Furies haven't had as much development. And we know, because, like, like, Kirby pitched doing a female Furies uh, solo, well, like, title that would just be about them. In fact, I, uh, the, 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 the Barda tattoo I have is of her 
on the uh, draft of a cover oh. that Kirby did for a female Furies like series that didn't get picked up. So yeah. he, you know, he wanted to be able to tell more of them, but he never had the opportunity to. And I'm so excited to see, you know, a woman picking up, picking that up now and doing it in a way that honors his work, but also makes it feel really relevant and timely, which is what it was when he was doing it then too, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that one of the great things about Kirby is that you can see how much um, he loves women and how, you know, uh, that, you know, that he believes that women are capable and strong and uh, and all of those um you know those things it's just that um you know he's also a product of the time that he was you know in and um mm-hmm. and if you look at a lot of um you know the stuff in the fourth world the women still are sort of to the side or not quite at mm-hmm. the table and stuff and so um so i'm i'm just sort of turning up the volume on what he had already in in his books and um you know and i'm sort of pushing that to the limit i mean i'm not in continuity right i'm outside of continuity so you know i i i can do i can push that in one way and it doesn't change you know if people want to do other things that that you Mm -hmm. know like um that dark side and all of them are you know in the actual dcu that doesn't really you know affect i'm just sort of trying to much like tom king um you know put a different put a different focus on um on the emotional arcs of these um characters and yeah now, earlier you mentioned you know that sort of what this what this series is looking at is the experience of being female in like hell but it's like mythical space hell yeah and i, I really love that because when when I was beginning to read the series, at first I was looking at it and said, oh, well, all the terrible things that are happening to the characters are just completely literal. Like these are just things that actually happen to people I know in the real world. And then I said, oh, crap. That's why this is so amazing that there is no allegory. This is literally showing that the experience of women that happens in the real world that's incredibly commonplace is literally hellish and the stuff of like horror. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's um and it and and it, you know, like I said, it's just sort of turning up the volume the volume on that. I mean, you know, when I think about someone like Granny Goodness and I think about the fact that, you know, she is uh, you know, you know, that that Kirby and that dark side decide to make her um a mother you know, like to be the mother of all the children, uh, to be, you know, to be in charge of the orphanage, which is sort of quote unquote women's work. It just Mm -hmm. really struck me as unfair because she so obviously is completely capable and could run her own planet, you know? (laughs) And so, and that, you know, that, I mean, it's though it's following those kinds of things that lead you to like, well, you know, of course, if you're dark side, you want to keep the most powerful person who could beat you. You want to keep them down, which is what happens mm-hmm. here in our world, you know, and um, mm-hmm. things that we're dealing with. So um, that was really fascinating to, like, take those characters and just sort of, you know, put them through their paces in the real world. And obviously, this is a hard book. It's not easy to write. It's not easy to read sometimes, um, you know, but um, but I'm, I'm just trying to sort of hold a mirror up to, you know, um, to the world. Well, you know, also you are doing what most comics writers in the big two are doing, which is writing characters created by Jack Kirby. And I think it's interesting that it feels like some of the discourse around the series has been like, it's like, oh, well, is it okay to come back and 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 address this work now and it's like everybody is breaking comic it, all all comics pretty much like unless it's doctor strange like all comics pretty much are actually just people doing different versions of kirby so yeah. you know that that that's where we all are at but you are working on a series that is much closer to jack's heart and desires than you know some of the earlier work that he was doing before he had as much creative freedom. Uh, so how do you how how have you approached that? Because I, I think you've done an amazing job of it, and I just know that it's so sensitive for people. Yeah, well, I mean, I you know just like with um with Shade, you know, which is created by Steve Ditko. So I mean, I really feel like I'm the luckiest girl in the world. I got to you know I get to sort of play with a Ditko and a Kirby. I mean, what what mm-hmm, is happening? Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> but uh, just like with Shade, I mean, what I did was I did my homework. I mean, I read you know the entire fourth world omnibus and I you know tried to go through and comb through and see what some of the themes are and when you look through 
you're looking at, um, you know, good and evil. You're looking at betrayal. You're looking at uh, connection. You're looking at, um, you know, interest in science and genetics and, um, yeah. you know, what it means to, um, you know, what it means to have free will, uh, you know, what it means to be controlled, um, you know, what it means to be a, a god, uh, what it means to be a human, you know. Um, these are really big things. And so I went through and I, I sort of – you know, took a lot of notes. I mean, my, my omnibus is just like 50 million post-its in it um, <laughs> of like things that I thought were really interesting that I could sort of pluck on and pull through. And, um, you know, I, I sent in my pitch. I mean, this all came about from a conversation that I had with Dan DiDio. Um, mm-hmm. And um, we were, you know, we were talking and, you know, I was trying to figure out what I could do next and, um, you know, and just sort of say, hey, I know you think I'm an indie girl, but, you know, maybe I could do something else. And um, and I had brought in uh, some um, some Xerox copies of uh, pages that I, you know, characters that I thought maybe I could crack and, you know, do something with um, from the DC Encyclopedia. And, you know, he was like, oh, that those are good thoughts, but this person's doing that and this person's doing that and you're too late for that one and whatever. And then um, he was telling me about all these projects. And, you know, as he was talking, it was just one boy thing with a boy vibe after another. And I just sort of was like, well, where's the Handmaid's Tale? You know, like, where's mm-hmm. the, you know, and he was like, oh, that's actually there's something there and it wasn't quite right. I mean, the handmaid's tale in the fourth world is not quite right. I mean, but it could work, you know, but, um, uh, so, you know, so then, um, so then we hit upon sort of, um, you know, what if it were the me too movement and, um, you know, and, uh, and the fourth world and what would that look like with the, with the female furies? I love it. And I, it's, it is definitely super timely, but also completely, all, like omnipresent and always and always the case. Um, I appreciated that you have these flashbacks to the start of Granny Goodness to earlier in Granny Goodness's career um, as a a leader and sort of showing how she rep- she's replicating the cycles of abuse that yeah. she was in without making it without like you know woobifying her or making us be like oh that poor woman like yeah. you still see the context with which it comes in and how she's perpetuated and like she is just every woman's who's had an abusive woman boss who's like letting out the agony of what's happened to them all over you. Like she's that. Yeah, That's what she's doing. Absolutely. And, uh, and also I feel like, you know, when, when you look at like sort of feminism and you look at women who, you know, were the only woman at the table in the 1940s yes. and the 1950s mm-hmm. and the 1960s and had to be tough as nails in a way that is different because they were jarring that door open, you know, for other women. And now we have a different kind of, um, feminism and then you know younger women have a different kind of feminism and it's all sort of a baton being passed but there are ways that we all survive and I think there are ways that Granny survived that are not the same way that the female furies can survive and so that you know that they demand something else and I and I, I wanted to explore that kind of dynamic too you know I think I think Granny is a very very complicated character because she has just tried to keep her place at the table with all the boys mm-hmm. for forever and that's been all that she's been living for, really. I mean, yeah. and that's, and if you're only caring for yourself, then you end up becoming yeah a tool of the establishment and exactly. oppression. Exactly. So. Yeah. And so I, to me, it was important to go back to how she started to like where you could see that she was a little bit more innocent. And like, you know, if she had been one of the female furies, she would be, you know, just as horrified as Barda is or, you know, like, you know, as Barda awakens and stuff. The other thing, too, mm-hmm. is that as as you probably know, I mean, like I when I looked at everything, um, I really came upon, um, you know, the issue of Mr. Miracle number nine that had uh, the story of Himone and um, Aurelie and is sort of the moment where um, Barda and Scott's love affair begins. And yeah. um, and that once I read that issue, I was like, this is what I can swing my whole story around. I love it. I never would have guessed somebody would center their story around O'Reilly. Like she's yeah. the most underdeveloped character because in part because she this for Christ's sake, folks, comics from 1972 can't be spoiled up uh, because she like dies, you know, in, really early in the story. Um, yeah. And, the you know, and it's so interesting because the the way she's sort of framed in the dialogue of the existing of, of in, 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 in 
in Jack Kirby's comics, you know, they're like, oh, she only wanted to have these, you know, she like, they sort of frame her as the innocent Mm -hmm. who only wanted to dream. And to see sort of like, you're offering like the background of Mm -hmm. like why she wanted to escape in those ways. And that actually she's not just an innocent. There's like more going on there. I I, I never would have expected. Super cool. Yeah. And, and I thought to me, that was the, that was like a good, a good place to sort of pull apart and pull open. And also because I mean, you know, when you come down to the female furies, I mean, Barda's our gal, you know? And so, and so, and you really want to like have that sort of dynamic between Barda and, and Scott, and there is no Barda and Scott if there's no Aureli. I mean, they, she is their inciting incident, you know? So, um, mm. so yeah, so that, so to me, you know, just to go back to your question before, I, you know, I did my homework and I went back and I, I read and I looked and then I, you know, I saw that as a, as a point where I could sort of wedge the door open and, you know, and fling it open to this, you know, other story that I wanted to tell about how they have an awakening and how they, you know, how they sort of, um, deal with, um, systemic misogyny and the patriarchy. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's 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 really cool to choose that particular character to present it through because she's the one who we have the least perspective on, and it's just sort of, you know, in the comics, like we are literally only seeing her through and through a male perspective. Yeah. Um, both in terms of the creative team and in terms of how she's addressed and talked about by the other characters. Yeah. Yeah. And so Willix. You have all this yeah, freedom. And, yeah. And Willix too. I mean, obviously, is like mm-hmm. you know he sort of has this sort of fixation on her you know, in that issue. And so that was, it. that was sort of like my entryway into his sort of horrible abuse. Yeah. <laughs> his terrible. Yeah. Yeah. He is a complete piece of shit. Yeah, he really um, is. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, with the series, you are uh, looking, it's so hard. I don't want to give any spoilers for issue yeah, I know. three, but folks like get on it go by them come back read issue three um it it is it is a little bit challenging for me to like talk about the future of the series for that reason um yeah. but i guess we could certainly say like um are there like a lot of different characters who are going to get sort of the spotlight issues on them or or is it going to continue to center with barda and Aurelie, or or I mean- how does it I think that what we can say is that perhaps the baton will be passed <laughs> to a different character. Um, you know, by as the baton, we, you mean yeah. the Megarod. <laughs> yes, by no, the Megarod. Um, yes. No, it's true. The Megarod. Um, my bad. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, um, I mean, you know, what I've... What I've always said about this book is that it is a series about an, a feminist, you know, like an awakening, and um, yeah. and so and that's what I've been going for, and I and I think that it's you know it's sort of um, obvious that the character that we know the most is Barda, and so you know I feel like I feel like you know it's not spoiling anything by saying that she's going to sort of become more and more important in the story. Gotcha. Well, I. You know, I, it's interesting because I know that like the pitch partially was talking about how this would, you know, would be a, a, a comic that would also be really great for a female audience. But a lot of the folks I know who've written really, you know, ac- really high praise for it are, are guys mm-hmm. who have all said like how much of a revelation it's been for them to read this comic and see this perspective. Yeah, that's been really, really nice because, of course, there are also some men who are not very happy with it at all. Um, and I really take those, um, you know, those those uh, essays that I've read where, you know, some gentlemen have been like, whoa, you know, this has been hard to read, but this is why I think it's important or whatever. Like, that's meant a lot to me because I, I feel like, you know, we're at a point where, um, you know, we want to have – a lot of stories about a lot of different things. And one of the great things about all these kinds of stories like Jack Kirby characters or whatever is that they are tough and they can withstand being, um, you know, seen through harsh lights um, Mm -hmm. in any way. And so, um, and I think that it's good to shake up, you know, the way that we read a story or the, you know, having a different perspective on the same story that we know and love um, to sort of shake up the way that we see our own world so that we can be attuned to seeing things that maybe we've been blind to and we also because of where we meet barda in the story we never really see barda being a bad guy like she's gruff and and 
curmudgeonly and doesn't take any shit from anyone but she's she's not the bad guy in except for in that one like him in issue you know uh like we don't see her being that much of a, a villain because she gets her awakening pretty quickly yeah. in the series so i it's 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 cool to sort of look at like yeah like what is she like before yeah scott well, I mean, and I also think, like, you know, I always like a story, you know, like uh, like the musical Wicked, where you're seeing, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West from a different point, mm-hmm. of, point of view and where she's the hero of the story. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and there's a softness to her. And I feel like it's the same way with Barda. I mean, my goodness, everybody on that planet is a terrible person and they're all killers and they're all terrible. But there have to be different degrees of terrible on a terrible planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... You know, the other thing I talk about is like, it, you know, when you look at the narratives of uh, 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 of Scott and of Orion, like the fact that they both become heroes, they both have uh, history in their lives that would make that seem like a direction that they could go in. Mm-hmm. I mean, ultimately, like one of the things I, lo- I love so freaking much and that it feels like a lot of people seem to have missed about the characters is how much of the whole Orion versus Scott thing comes down to like somebody posing to Kirby. Do you believe that goodness is nature or right. nurture? Absolutely. And Kirby's answer is both. It's both. We yep. can have it be both. Yep. And I like, I love you. But the thing that's so yeah. cool with Barda is she's the one who completely just chooses yeah. to stand for justice. She doesn't have a secret, you know, good guy dad, or she wasn't raised on a planet with people who were trying to nurture her and treat her well. Yeah. Her parents are, I don't think we know, and yeah. she's on Hell Planet, and she still makes that choice. Yeah. She's and like the biggest hero. Exactly. And, and you know, I mean, in Kirby's Mr. Miracle number nine, she becomes that hero because of, of her relationship with um Aureli and what happens mm-hmm. to her i mean that is it that is the that is the linchpin in barda's story i mean that is the that is the moment where she awakens not just in my story but in kirby's story that's right that's how she makes her choice she sees hell and she decides this is not for me and risks everything, everything. and she like and she was the she's the leader she she's yep. she's the one who's in a position of power and makes that so makes that yeah. choice. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's really it is really it is really fascinating. And also it's like just to go back to like when I was talking about, you know, doing my, you know, my homework and stuff, um, you know, like what you're left with with Kirby is that that's why I said he, you know, he's dealing with a lot of questions about science and genetics and, you know, like you said, nurture nature, like all of that kind of stuff. He, you know, it's all in the fabric of the fourth world book. Mhm. Yeah, I I I think that the fourth world are the best comics that were ever made. That's my personal, you know. I I have like my 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 right arm above the elbow is entirely Jack yeah. Kirby fourth world art, but um, but I truly think that they're like the pinnacle of comics, and I'm I'm so glad that more people are reading them and picking them up now. Yeah, I mean, I I I agree. It is an astounding piece of literature. I mean, it really is like a such a complete world and and it and when you read like the omnibus which puts it in a sort of order that makes a lot of sense um Mm -hmm. it's just so sweeping and epic i mean it's it's like it's it's operatic it's wagnerian you know it's like it's like you know it's just it's it's really wonderful and then there there are you know little corners of it that i could dig into and you know what i mean just like i did with that one issue i could go into other issues and like you know dig out that part or you know what i mean write yeah, a whole thing yeah. from there or there i mean i think i'm doing what my destiny is to do you know like whatever with it but uh my mm-hmm. gosh what what an honor and what i don't want to say fun because it's not fun writing about harassment and abuse and systemic misogyny but um but it's it's as a writer it's very compelling yeah, I mean, like just putting together my blurb for the opening of the show, I was like, which one of the 5,000 political angles in the fourth world do I want to make my opening right. pitch in? Because, you know, I always begin my show with like, a, this is the show, for, yep. you know, so I sort of have some sort of political insight via comics thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, this, this, this today we're going to make it be about Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook algorithm and the right. anti-life equation. Like, because it's, it's in there. I yeah. mean, like, it, it's all in there. I, have, I had the big piece in um, 
Daily Beast, you know, to, like uh-huh. after the election, like a, like a glorious Godfrey is Donald Trump. Like, <laughs> I, it's like oh, an endless man, source you're of things. So right. Oh, gross. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Can go check it out online. Um, yeah, if you if you look if you look up be a Jack Kirby and Ilana and uh, on Daily Beast, you'll find the essay. <laughs> but funny. like, yeah, like it, it. And and but and you're doing this from you know a fiction perspective yeah. rather than like a writing a big ass essay yeah. about it perspective. Um, you know, I, I just want to, like, give a really big shout out to because I, I couldn't do this book without someone as graceful as um, Adriana Mello, who mm-hmm. is the artist that I'm working with on this. Um, it's just been amazing to work with her. And I, I think that, you know, she lends such a... Um, a good Kirby style to um, the book that we're doing. And she handles some very, very hard scenes with just such an emotional depth and tenderness in hard, difficult, terrible moments. Um, And I just really appreciate that. And I also really need to give a shout out to, um, you know, um, uh, Hi-Fi, who's doing the amazing job with colors and and to the um, editor, Jamie Rich and um, Brittany Holzer, who really Mm -hmm. sort of push me as a writer, you know, like when, you know, like I'll hand in a draft and then, you know, it's not just like, okay, we're ready. Let's go to lettering. It's like, all right. Let's get in there. Let's roll up our sleeves and, you know, and make it 100% better. And um, so I just I just really want to make sure I'm giving them all the love, all the people. <laughs> well, I was looking at the pages where we have um, Barda fighting. No, sorry, not Barda. Uh, Granny Goodness, younger Granny Goodness fighting um, Hegara. Mm-hmm. I th- yes. Yep. And I... The way that Hagara's hair is rendered, and particularly the way uh, it's inked, I was like, "This is this is perfect." Like it would be so easy to get her hair wrong, yeah. <laughs> and and it's not just that it's drawn in the shape that it is in the original comics, but there's this weight to it, and the yeah. way that the blacks are sort of like blocky across it that yeah. you know there's a lot of artists whose art is very clearly like straight up riffing on kirby and hers is not like a kirby look-alike or it's not like a kirby, kirby 2.0 it's not doing that but it's it's cap it definitely captures some of his particular visual grammar um, when it comes to just really interesting subtle things like that even to me um, as well as her fondness for drawing actual muscular women, which yeah. thank you, yeah. necessary. Um, that I just think is a really good connection, really good fit for this. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, like, um, I think both of us, me and Adriana, are trying to honor Kirby. Do you know what I mean? Like to mm-hmm. honor him and his legacy, but also, you know, to make it our own in 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 our in our own way and i think that like when it comes to sort of hair you know i think that's like women's hair <laughs> like when you have a woman artist <laughs> doing women's hair like they're thinking about you know what does that ponytail look like how hard should you know how how much would you know that helmet weigh or whatever like they're thinking about stuff like that yeah not totally. that boys can't do that i don't know but it's often yeah. true like it, when i think about the artists who are most reliably considering costuming as an important part of character development and world right. building like i'm looking more op- more than often it's uh, it, it's women or uh, artists who are gay men who are like or, or non-binary artists or like the folks who really seem to get how important that is yeah um and of course kirby really got that is the ironic part like kirby's fashion choices are amazing yeah. um and his fashion inventions, like when it comes to costumes, yeah. like for this, are amazing. And like, yeah, like caring enough about the specifics of this bad guy, of this bad woman, <laughs> of the bad uh, uh, older woman's hair, like enough to actually and to capture it that way. And also just her face and her facial expressions yeah. are straight out of the original comics. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing too that um, that uh, I did w- with Adriana, you know, before she came on was um, I, uh, I I created a Pinterest um, mm-hmm. where I uh, I looked at I just combed the internet for women that I thought looked like their bodies, their body shapes looked like. Barda, Stampa, Mad Harriet, or really, you know, like Granny, um, just to sort of 
um, you know, remind us of like, you know, sort of how these different bodies are and stuff like that. And I'd actually gotten it. I just met Kelly Sue DeConnick and she um, was, I was at a barbecue and she was there and she was like, oh, do you want to see my Pinterest for Aquaman? I was like, fuck yeah, I want to see that. And so, and <laughs> I want to see your yeah. Pinterest for Aquaman. <laughs> and it was just so inspiring, you know. I mean, I'd done a Pinterest with Marley um, Zarconi for Shade the Changing Girl where um, we sort of, anytime we saw a picture that we thought looked like madness, we would put it on this Pinterest so that we kind of, at the beginning of the book, had like a a sort of vocabulary of what we thought madness could look like. Um, but, you know, but this was like next level. This was sort of like, you know, mood board for apocalypse and like, you know, or the, like that I, the idea that I took from Kelly, you know, and also like, um, you know, what, you know, what these women, you know, like what the essence of like a stampa is, you know, and, um, yeah. or what the, and for me, for Aurelie, I, I, I decided that because, um, because it's canon in Kirby's original that she likes to dance and that, you know, and that she dances, um, that I wanted her fighting style to be very ballet. And so, you know, I put in a lot of pictures of like, you know, just these powerful ballerinas just sort of doing kicks and, you know, jumping and, you know, leaping and stuff like that. Cause, um, you know, because we were kind of creating or really from, uh, the ground up in a way. Right. We never saw her fight in the comics. Yeah. So, and there's a scene uh, where the characters are sort of, you get to see sort of what their dreams of what a different kind of life would be. Uh-huh. And I was so struck by Mad Harriet uh-huh. and what her like dream self is thinking actually. Yeah. yeah I, for me, that was really important because like, I think Mad Harriet, it's very easy to just be like, ha ha ha, she's crazy. She's mad, you know, like, or whatever. And I think she's mm-hmm. a much deeper person than that, you know? And I think she is just, I think she's probably just really misunderstood for the way that she sees the world, which I suspect is quite brilliant. Yeah, totally. And I, the way Bernadette talks about Bernadette's particular contempt and frustration with Aureli is like so like literally things I've heard women say about other women yeah from a position of like envy and hurt yeah and how it's easier for her to lash out against other women than it is for her to lash out against the actual men who are causing the problem yeah and I think when you grow up with a brother like Desaad you know I think that's <laughs> probably part of the fabric of your you know of your personality but I also really think that Bernadette to me seems like she'd be bear with me I think she'd be really great to have at a dinner party because I mm-hmm. suspect that she's fucking hysterical like she is just dry <laughs> wit you know what I mean? Just like sharp yeah. as attack, like, you know, can like cut you down with like one pun, you know, like just like, like just, you know, that kind of, that kind of a lady. And I also think that probably she has been told by her brother, you know, how, you know, unremarkable she is. Yep. Cause that's what he is. He's yeah. like the sadist. That He's, is his job. Yep. So, yeah. No, it was really fun. I mean, you know, I I wish I could even flush them out more. If only I had 12 issues, you know, then I, you know, that I could do even more with all of them. But, you know, it's a large cast, you know, and trying to get a lot done. So, you know, you do what you can. Well, actually, so how many issues is the series? Six. Oh, okay. Is it? I'm, I'm pretty sure this isn't spoilery at all uh, for this question I'm going to ask. If for some reason it is, tell me. But um, so like, what do you think is behind Lashina's particular choice of weapon and costuming? Like what is her when she's like, I'm going to have lashes wrapped around my body and I'm going to whip the hell out of people in my like dominatrix get up. Like, <laughs> like what's the psychology like from, and if that's something that you go into more later than like, just let's, not do that now. No, but. I mean I actually don't go into it at all. I just feel like I feel like, you know, she wants to be in control and I feel like she really wants to um, you know, be in control and and to have mm-hmm. and to have uh, and to have the power. So I think it's like she just wants to dominate because she feels like she's, you know, um like that's the way that she protects herself, I think. Yeah. That's true. And actually, the costuming is also sort of like, the straps are sort of like, they're protective, like they're mm-hmm. weapons, but they're also protective. Yep. 
I, I think so. And I, you know, and I think that, I think Lashina to me is, a, um, you know, even in the Kirby, um, you know, in the Kirby books, like Lashina is the one who becomes the leader. You know, I think she's just yeah. a very ambitious, you know, person who wants to be in control of her own destiny. And Stampa is always so exciting for me because she's one of the only characters who, no matter what the artist is, people always draw her as like a big, solid, strong, broad woman. Yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, there's artists who've done, who've drawn Barda before who like don't make her larger than her husband, which is ridiculous. There's artists who like don't reckon, you know, who like, they, there's artists who like will make, Barda looked just like any other woman in the DCU, which is completely missing the point. But artists never makes if they never make Stampa a skinny little thing. Like yeah. she's just immune to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Stampa just because she is so massively powerful in that in that way. And I think that's maybe it's easier for people. It's just obvious, like oh, that's the big girl, you know. Whereas, like, I think sometimes people don't, you know, like they don't remember how big Barda is supposed to be. I mean, it's in her well, name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> it's in her name. And, and I, I know. And it's also sort of like, I think it's because, because she's, because she's, she's more on the conventionally attractive side of things yeah. that like some people who have, shall we say, basic tastes forget that like, no, actually that's also part of it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, but obviously, like I think Stampa is super hot and awesome too. So. Yeah, she is. She's 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 pretty great. I would I would have loved to have explored. I would love to explore Stampa a little bit more. But you know, um, but I think Stampa is just like I think Stampa is like that solid best friend. Like I think she's. Mm-hmm. I think I think she's the person that you could like count on. Yep. I mean, she's basically in all the different incarnations of the Furies, so yeah. like, that's her presence too. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, she's very dependable. And she will stomp anything. That is. Oh, she will totally. <laughs> she'll stomp you. She'll stomp me. She'll stomp everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it's right in the can. Yeah. What, what she does is, on the, is in the label. Yeah. So I um, do want to talk at least a little, little bit about some of the other work comics you've done. I, I, just remem- I just remembered you did the wonderful Galentine's Day Hawk Girl. I did. A short in the uh, Mysteries of Love in Space yes. <laughs> special that DC did this year for Valentine's Day, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And that was really fun because um, because I wanted to do something, you know, uh, Valentine's Day is so dumb sometimes. <laughs> and, like, mm-hmm. um, I wanted to do something where it wasn't about, you know, it was about the true love that you have between your friends, you know, that like your gal pal. So that's why it's Galentine's Day, because I really feel that like that is like, like your friendship with women, like, um, you know, is like, you know, your best friends, your best gal pals, like those are that they know where the bodies are buried. They, you know, they know how to like, you know, take you out when you're down. They last oftentimes a lot longer than our, you know, our boyfriends or our girlfriends do, you know, or, or, you know, our lovers, you know? So, um, so I think that, uh, that I just wanted to write a story that was about the sort of power of friendship and that that's an honorable thing to celebrate on Valentine's day too. Totally. I mean, when I, when I, the fact that like there's a holiday that is actually really celebrated by a lot of people that was invented by characters, like by writers of a TV show and yeah, it sort of developed its own life. Yeah. I, you know, I think our, our society is just really ready to like have go- holidays that celebrate different things than necessarily like what we were raised with. I totally agree. You know, I, I totally agree. And that it's not just like the nor you know it's like it's that like what does love mean you know like Valentine's Day it just uh, there are so many different types of love it doesn't just have to be about romantic love. And with Hawk Girl being a character who like there's been with yes. all of her different incarnations there's been such a problem of having her just being connected to men who are often really abusive and psycho sometimes the writers knowing that and doing that on purpose sometimes the writers not seeming to know that yeah. I had a different hot girl, though, because my hot girl is the new hot girl, you know. Um, and so, you know, she has this 1,000-year-long relationship with um, Hawkman. So, you know, so that was a little bit different. And she, you know, they just broke up. Yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. So it's, it's like, finally, you yeah. know, I, it's, a, it, it's a complicated, it's a complicated story. <laughs> yeah, it's a very complicated story. So that's why I was like, how about, how about she has beers with her friend how about that (laughs) 
It's what she needs. Like, yeah. that's really what, like, I would want for a hot girl. Yeah. So, there yeah. you go. So, she's got some, yeah, hangout time. Um, yeah. That was super fun. Um, when With uh, Shade the Changing, did you uh, sort of... Uh, were you, did, was that a concept that you had pitched to? I didn't. Um, at the, what happened was that Gerard Way was doing his pop-up imprint um, of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a young animal. And um, he had come up with the concept of it being, uh, an, uh, you know, Shade the Changing Girl, that it was, you know, an alien that possessed a 16-year-old girl and who was the biggest bully in her school. And that's the sentence that, Gerard and Shelley Bond gave me and then I I went and did what I did with it. So um so he came he sort of passed me the baton. Cool. That that was just interesting because like I just between this and that like you definitely are a writer who's making herself known as someone who's like, you know, going into characters that have like really critically acclaimed historic and like beloved stories about them and figuring out a way to take it from an in, in, in a new perspective, bringing a new angle to it. Yeah. I mean, I hope I get to keep doing stuff like that. You know, I'm sure I will, but um, and I think it makes it a little bit easier, quote unquote, when you're not in sort of like, you know, the actual sort of shared universe, because mm. you can kind of march, you know, you can kind of, um, you can do things that don't affect other things. I think it becomes hard when you do sh- shared universe stuff. Hmm. Well, I do think for me, like your female fairies book is canon to me. So oh, regardless you. of what anybody says, thank this is canon you. to me. <laughs> Maybe I just need to tell that to myself. Like, it's not canon. You can do what you want and then give myself the freedom to do it. Mm-hmm. And then other people can make decisions about whether or not it, it counts or not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of things have gone in reverse. Like there's stuff that came from Elseworlds and from other platforms that right. became, you know, canon and universe. So why, why not this? Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you never really are know. filling in holes. Yeah. So, like, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I, I'd be very interested to see what Ava DuVernay does with uh, The Fourth World when she gets, you know, when she does her film. Oh, God, I know. And it's it's so complicated because it's like there's going to be so much pressure and the assholes are going to be coming so hard. Oh, I know. <laughs> and the funny thing is most of those assholes, like, probably haven't even read New Gods. Yeah. It's true. And I uh, will have to, because like when I, when I heard they chose her, I was like, oh, this is great because this is, because New Gods is about some really freaking serious stuff. And Ava DuVernay is an artist who we know can handle really serious stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I mean, and, and also like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how she casts it, you know, mm-hmm. because I'm sure it'll be a diverse cast. And um, that yeah. makes me really, really excited. I mean, I would have loved to have done that without, with me and Adriana's, um, female furies, but I think we thought we were already pushing it so far that we would just, you know, sort of keep it sort of the way, you know, sort of original old school rather than like reinvent all what the furies looked like. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 sir, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm white, but like, it didn't scan to me in any way as being like a problem, like, yeah. we're, you know, with these characters, especially because like, there are people who are, we're not like, they're not being established as like role models for, no, they are not. <laughs> for the future generations of kids, for example. But yeah, but their stories and what they're encountering are all so like, yep, this literally happens to people yeah. and you can see it play out in literal comics hell if it's yeah. not clear enough to you how messed up that is. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, so what else do you have coming up soon? So um, I have a, a book with Jim Rugg, um, you know, The Plain Janes, um, which mm-hmm. we actually got the rights back from DC Comics a couple years ago. And so um, we're doing a new book three. It's going to come out as an omnibus, book one, two, and a new book three in January of 2020 um, on uh, Little Brown, which is a book publisher. Hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that series. So Plain Janes is about a girl named Jane who lives in a fictional city called Metro City where she is in a terrorist attack and um, her parents freak out and they move her to the suburbs and in order to deal with her trauma... Uh, at the site, uh, she saved a man at the at the at the incident, and she found his sketchbook that said "Art Saves." And so she decides to take that as her mission. And in order to mm-hmm. deal with her trauma, she forms a uh, all girl guerrilla art group 
that does street art and art attacks to make an attack be something beautiful rather than something terrible. And that's how she sort of is dealing with her, you know, sort of PTSD and trauma. And, um, and so they do art, like Banksy style art installations and things. And, um, and so, and she ha- it forms a group called Plain, which is people loving art in neighborhoods. And all of her friends also happen to be named Jane. So that's why it's called <laughs> the Plain Janes. I love it. I'm yeah. super on board for this. Yeah, it's, I'm really proud of it. And Jim, J- you know, like Jim and I are so happy because we had originally, you know, we had had, um, two more books that we wanted to write that we were supposed to write, but then Minx got canceled. And so now by doing this book three, we kind of get to like tell the whole story that we wanted to tell. So Mm -hmm. we're really excited about that. So was this three, was book three a decent jumping off point or should people need to start from the beginning? Oh, it's going to be, they're all going to be published in the same book. So it'll be an omnibus of book one, two and three. Yeah. So you don't, you can, you you just have to buy that one book. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm definitely excited to hear that. He does yeah. really cool work too. So yeah. So and then there are some other things that are not quite announced yet on other places that you know that and and elsewhere um, you know um, that will be announced soon <laughs> that I can't talk about yet. Okay, looking forward to hearing about those. If you have any last tips for uh, listeners who might be coming in looking at uh, coming into comics writing from other kinds of writing backgrounds. Um, always people are always looking for advice in that area. Yeah. Well, one thing, the best thing, when I first started writing comics, it was, um, you know, even though I'd read a lot of comics and stuff and I obviously understood that it was sequential art, you know, um, and stuff, I felt very tripped up by how do you move from panel to panel. And um, I called up Jim Rugg and I was crying and he said, Cecil, just write whatever you want on the page and I will figure it out. I'm your swim buddy. And so my best Mm. um, advice is work with your artist because your artist, you're, you're both working in tandem. And um, I, you know, oftentimes write the script as though it is a love letter to my artist. Like, Hey Jim, I'm thinking this, or Hey Adriana, what do you think if we did something like this? And it's not because I'm wishy-washy. It's because I feel like the job of the writer is to give the artist a good scaffolding of the story so that then they can take it to that next level when they're doing panels. I mean, obviously, when I work for DC, I do full script when I'm doing a monthly comic book, you know, which is, you know, I'm doing panel one, panel two, panel three, panel four, like writing it all down and saying what's in it. But I always, at the top of my relationship with an artist, always say, just please look at this as a guideline and do what you know, if you see a better way of doing it or if you want to do it in three panels or six panels, whatever it is, you just go for that. Um, And then if I'm doing an indie project, I'll ask the artist, like I've worked with Nate Powell and Sarah Veron um, Mm -hmm. and I, you know, and and, uh, Jose Pimenta, which was uh, Soupy Leaves Home, which was a book that came out last year on Dark Horse. And um, with those, um, I often do um, an open script where I just do, um, you know, I write page one and then I do action and dialogue and I let them break it down. But I always ask them what they prefer. Love it. Yeah, those are really good things to keep in mind. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Where can our listeners uh, check out your work online, for example, like your Twitter presence, website? Twitter is Miss Cecil, um, at Miss Cecil. And then uh, my website is CecilCastellucci.com. Um, but if you put, if you can't, if you can't spell that, you can just put misscecil.com and it'll get you there oh, too. Oh, cool. You got the reroute. Very yeah. smart. Spelling is hard. <laughs> and, um, yeah, on, on, I'm on Instagram, but it's my old punk name. So it's Cecil Seaskull. It's a great punk name, by <laughs> the way. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming out. And, and to our listeners, uh, this is Elana Levin on Twitter as E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn, Elana Brooklyn. On Twitter, a little bit too much. Um, and you're feel free to contact us there. And make sure to come to graphicpolicy.com for comics news and reviews and cultural analysis. We have some coverage coming up of uh, Shazam movie and some more interviews with other amazing comics writers and artists. And I hope you'll join us because we're always here to keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. 
www.thepeopleshow.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.